Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. They were the M&M boys, Mickey and Roger. They were chasing the babe. The 1961 Yankees, the greatest baseball team ever. 61 home runs, the most ever by a non-juiced baseball player. And no asterisk. Phil Pepe, one of the premier New York City sports writers of the last 40 years, covered that historic home run race. Phil was the New York Yankee beat writer for the World Telegram and Sun. He went on to serve at the New York Daily News as the Yankee reporter from the late 60s to the early 90s. Phil's the author of some four dozen books, several of them on my beloved Yankees. Phil's a former president of the Baseball Writers Association of America and a Sometimes guest here. Welcome back, Phil. Good it's to been see you two again. years almost to the day. Really? Okay. 1961, this book. Uh, 1961, Asterisk, the inside story of the Maris Mantle home run chase. 50 years ago. Amazing. You were a young man. Three years old. I was old. 14. Yeah, three years. <laughs> my, my foot. And you covered this. This is your first big beat, no? Yeah, and it came about accidentally because if you n remember the name Dan Daniel, he yeah. was the Yankees beat writer. Right. And we had a columnist by the name of Joe Williams. And I think what happened was Joe Williams got ill, and so they had Dan Daniel move, move up to do the column. Right. And they needed somebody to cover the Yankees. Oh, and you were there. Uh, 21, 22. Now, where were you before? What were you covering? Covering uh, college. Well, I started out doing high school sports. A year or two later, I started. I was doing college sports, college uh, baseball, whatever. Right. Track and field, an occasional Yankee game. So I was at. I showed my face around Yankee Stadium a little bit, but on August 2nd, I went on a trip and took over the Yankees. Oh, okay, what's your describe the scene and your reaction? Well, my reaction is, what am I doing here? I hate this team. I'm a Brooklyn Dodgers right. fan. So, I'm so why? So come on. Did you ever? Did you ever come to like them? You like them now? Of course. Okay. Well, individuals. I like individuals. But the team. I hated. All right, here, let me try it. I hated Yogi Berra. Who hates Yogi Berra? You hated Yogi Berra because he killed my Dodgers. Oh, okay. Okay. He, was, he used to beat up a dime. Oh, and the tomahawk. I mean, oh, go ahead. So now I go on the, my first road trip, and I'm in the lobby of the hotel waiting to go to the ballpark that evening, and who comes up to me but Yogi Berra, the man I hate, right? <laughs> but he kind of recognized me because I had been around Yankee Stadium a little bit, and he said, hey, kid, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I'm waiting for the game. He said, take a walk with me. i got to buy Carm a, a birthday present. So I went. <laughs> shopping with Yogi Berra while right, he bought On your first day on the job. <laughs> right, exactly. Could not wait until I got back to my room to pick up the phone and call my folks and said, Mom, guess who I just went shopping with right, Yogi Berra. Right, that's a good one. Uh, 50 years later, I mean, he's still a friend. He's a wonderful guy. Character. You know, not only a character, but a, a wonderful guy. Great guy to be around. Who hates Yogi Berra? I mean, I love Yogi Berra. But the man are, who hated Yogi. I mean, this is a this is a tagline. All of them: Mickey Mantle, Whitey Ford, Elston Howard. They, they killed my Dodgers. Phil Rizzuto. Now all. Well, you got a break in '55 with Sandy oh, Alvarez wow. and Yogi. Oh wow! Big deal. Come on. Thanks. I mean, they that's let what us you win deserve. <laughs> and then you won it against Chicago in '59. That yeah. doesn't count. They went to LA. That right? was, okay. That was, okay. So yeah. so your, the, your first game in this race was the race. I mean, if, as I recall, they're both around 40 home runs when you come in. The race is a race now. Oh, absolutely. And for some reason, and I don't know uh, what prompted me to do this, but we, I used to keep a diary of, of uh, my columns, my, my uh, stories, and I still have that diary. So I was able to go to that diary and from Ooh, August 2nd wow. on... Steal from myself stories that I covered. Well, that's, I, I mean, it's really an inside story. Well, that's exactly the point. I mean, I was there. Now, talk about the first home run. Do you recall who no. it, which ones it up? No. Talk about, talk about the remaining two months. Well, a little bit more with the World Series. It was very exciting. It was historic. 
uh, I had no idea. I didn't even know how long I was going to be on the beat, but it turned out I was there for the rest of the season. And I think the, the sports editor had to be crazy to entrust me, a, a, a neophyte, with such a big assignment, but I'm grateful that he did. It was very interesting. Now, who, who else was covering the Yankees? You were part of that group called the Chipmunks, that, sort of a new breed of of sports writer that sort of called things the way they were rather exactly. than the team line. Well, Stan Isaacs was at Newsday, and he was one. He was a chipmunk. Uh, Leonard Schechter was at the New York Post, and he was considered a chipmunk. But there were also veterans like... Uh, John, was Maury Allen? Uh, the Maury Allen was not yet. He he, jo he I think he was working for Sports Illustrated at the time. Uh -huh. He joined the the New York Post. I think the following oh, year. Okay. Now he was around the ballpark a little bit, but not for the Post, but for right. Sports Illustrated. Right. But uh, John Drebinger for the New right. York Times. I remember that. Har Harold Rosenthal for the Herald Tribune. Yep. You had all those papers. Yeah. You had, what eight papers? Nine Tilford papers? Denzi from the uh, Journal American. And uh, Jack Lang uh, from the did, did Long Island Pro did Jack Lang Jack do? Lang because had been the Dodger writer, but uh, when the Dodgers left Brooklyn, he was covering the, the Yankees. Because yeah. I read the press yeah, every exactly. day. This was I love this because this was memories. This was I was fourteen. My father, my brother, and I went to like fifteen or twenty games. Jimmy Pierce all hiding behind the monuments. We used to sit in the nosebleed seats, a <laughs> buck thirty, and we used to spend double headers there. My mother got us out of the house. She hated us because we were Yankee fans and she was a Dodger fan. So talk about the rest of the season. When I made the trip, I was told by the sports editor, a man by the name of Joe Val, a uh, longtime sports editor in New York, graduate of Fordham University. Uh, he told me that my job every day, uh, World Telegram Sun was an afternoon paper. Right. right? So it was, it was not play by play. It was not reporting the game. It was the overnight, the second day angle sort of mm -hmm. thing, interviews and so on. I was told that no matter what they did, Mandel and Maris had to be written about every single day. If they struck out four times, if they hit four home runs, didn't matter. Whatever they did, I had to report every single day, which I did. And there were incidents that came about. That was the year when Roger's hair started falling out out of stress. Yeah, talk about that. Well, that was something. Who knew? What that, yeah, what, what, what was that all about? He, all of a sudden, he starts uh, complaining to Bob Fisher, the uh, public relations director, that his hair was falling out in clumps. They took him to a doctor. They uh, gave him, put him through a series of tests, whatever they did, and they concluded that it was just stress. Because of the home run race. Yeah, and 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 Maris throughout this and in the you know in the earlier stuff that I've read and then Billy Crystal's sixty one asterisk, he seems almost particularly ill suited for the home run race. Temperamentally, didn't, didn't want the attention. Right, didn't, lonely guy. He was a, a, from a small town. First of all, didn't even want to be a Yankee. No, he wanted to. He loved Kansas City. He wanted to stay in Kansas City. But Kansas City. City was the Yankees' farm team. Well, yeah, uh, but I mean, he would have been happy staying in Kansas City yep. for the rest of his career. Yep. Didn't want the attention. He came to to like New York. Grew to like New York thanks to a. Uh, a, a guy by the name of Julie Isaacson, right? Who Big Julie, who took him in, uh, under his wing and showed him the ropes and helped him, uh, took him to restaurants. Uh, this is an odd couple. Yeah, it was an odd, a completely odd couple, but a very close bond between the two. And so Roger was was difficult to cover because he was not forthcoming. He didn't give you much. He wasn't, there was no malice no. there. My, uh, I thought that Billy Crystal did a wonderful job in recreating that season. The two actors were superb. And they even looked like. Oh, they did. They must have done their homework, studying their speech pattern, the, 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 the way that they spoke, the way they looked, the, the gestures, swings, everything. everything. I know. Thomas Jane and Barry Pepper was, yep. was uh, uh, Jane was Mantle, Pepper was uh, Maris. Maris. Yep. But... The one complaint I have with that... that Go ahead. They needed a villain because it's Hollywood. Somebody has to be a villain. So who is the villain? The press. Now, I ask you, did we not want to see Roger Maris break the record or somebody break the record? Why would you root against somebody breaking a... Well, there's a difference between not rooting against somebody and, and Maris rather than Mantle. But because I know as a fan... We sure. were on one side or the other. Absolutely. And almost everybody was on the Mantle Absolutely. side. People, it was logical to say... 
Mar Mantle was more deserving of it because of his history with the team and what he had done in the past, and he was a true superstar. And it was, even the players admitted, I, Mel uh, Muscarin admitting that yep. he, they wanted to see Mickey do yep. it, but they weren't rooting against Roger. Yep, no. Whoever did it deserved the credit. The, the writers were not anti maris Some of them wanted, nobody rooted openly against him or for him, but some of them, I'm sure, in their hearts wanted Mantle to, to break the record. If but somebody was going to do if it. If somebody was going to do it. But once it became obvious that Mickey wasn't going to do it, of course I wanted to see Maris do it. I wanted to be part of history. Right. But some of your older colleagues who were of the Ruth era, clearly, there was a lot of antagonism, it seemed, from a lot of the non-New York older sports writers toward Maris breaking that record. Not only Maris, but anybody. Yeah, anybody, yeah. right. But Maris, right. Maris was the guy right. who was doing it. But if Mantle had done it, they still would have been upset, but I think a little bit less so. Probably. Okay. Let's go to the asterisk, because you have, in your title, 1961 asterisk, but as you point out, there was never an asterisk. Never was. Talk about this mythology of the asterisk and what actually happened. As I recollect what happened, and again, it was uh, I didn't realize it at the time, and I wasn't at the meeting, but there was a meeting. Well, go back to the fact that Ford Frick, who was the commissioner of baseball, had been a friend and the ghostwriter. He was a sports writer, Ford Frick, at one time, uh -huh. had been the friend and the ghostwriter for Babe Ruth. Right. So he had a... Sym sympathetic relationship, uh, a, a bond with Ruth. He was didn't want to apparently didn't want to see that record broken. Get, if, no, didn't want anybody to break right. it. So, and there were other writers who uh, had gone back to Ruth's day who felt likewise. Mm -hmm. So they kept bombarding. Uh, it turned out. I mean, I guess we have to backtrack. Go ahead. We never mentioned the fact that this was the year, first year of expansion. Okay, they, well, this is one of the reasons why maybe they hit the home run. It's the first year of American League expansion. They go from 8 to 10. Impact on the game. Pitchers. So what did, what did that put? There were 20-some right. uh, 20 more pitchers. 25% more pitchers. Yeah, who, 25, 25 pitchers in the major leagues who should have been in the minor league. Right. So that helped. Also, they had a longer schedule. It's now a 162-game yep. schedule. Babe Ruth played and 154 that's, games. And this gets into asterisk so territory. people began to say, well, it's not fair. He's got more opportunities, uh, expansion, blah, blah, blah. And they kept bothering, appealing to uh, F Ford Frick. Well, uh -huh. what are you going to do about this, Ford? What are you going to do about this? So he had a meeting. He called the veteran writers into his office. I was not one of them. Uh, because this happened in July, and I wasn't even covering the team at the right. time. And the way I heard it is that Dick Young, my friend, my mentor, and at one time my boss, was in that, this meeting. At the Daily News. At the Daily News, was at this meeting, and Ford Frick said something like, well, we will try to have some kind of two, if somebody breaks this record, we will have two entries in the in the." Uh, official record book. Uh, one for 162 games, one for 154 games. And he was kind of f trying to come up with the, the terminology. And, and Dick Young said, oh, you mean like an asterisk? And Ford Frick apparently said, yeah, that's right. Something like that, like an asterisk. Although I don't even think that Frick ever uttered the word asterisk. asterisk. But the funny thing about it is that he's talking about the home. That should have stood for all records, not only right. the home run right. record. Right, right. Why single well, listen? And in fact, as I recall, in, into the 90s, they really had two, two records, yes. one in the 154. Right. But that was the only record where they exactly. had this dual yes. record keeping. And there were dozens of records that were made in 154. Sure. Big records, huge records. I mean, uh, uh, Wadey Ford breaking uh, Babe Ruth's consecutive innings record. Well, All but that was the World Series record. Yeah, that's, so that's true. That, yeah, that, that that's okay. Apply. Yeah. But uh, I guess I'm not even sure that there were any other records broken. There must have been, but I can't even remember if there were. There, there had to be. Probably. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's no asterisk. No asterisk. And then, excuse me, why, do, why does Phil Pepe's latest book have an asterisk? Because it became a cause celeb. Right, it's iconic. <laughs> yeah. But I mean... But you know that you're the one who disillusions us by saying there's no asterisk. 
I, but I didn't write the cover. I just write the. the this, by the way, is a great cover. Yeah, they did a good really job. good cover. Okay, let's go back and look at Maris and Mantle and some of the other players. I mean, you look at that team. That's sixty-one team. That's a powerhouse. It was is the, the, is the best it, team I've ever seen. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, you you've been around a little bit longer than I am. I don't. There's no team that's better. I don't think, well... Uh, I mean, the pitching staff, there may have been better pitching staffs. Well, there's one right now. Oh, yeah, police. <laughs> but you had Louis Arroyo, who was Mariano Rivera all over again, and you had Wadey Ford, and then you had, you know, you had... You didn't have a great staff. No, it was not a great pitching staff, one through four, and, which is, and but it, it was, was four, not right. five. Yep. And there's a, a story about that. That was uh, Ralph Hawk's first year yep. as manager. Yep, And the story that Whitey Ford tells is that he went to a St. John's ba basketball game at the Garden during the winter between the 60 and 61 World Series. Remember, the Yankees had lost the World Series in 1960. Oh. Ah, I'm to sorry Pittsburgh. to bring that up. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, they scored 900 more <laughs> runs. They were clearly the better team. And then Mazeroski hits that home run. That's why 61 was such an important And that's season. why Stengel got fired. Oh, and man. He, wasn't, he, wasn't, uh, he didn't resign. He was right. fired. And sure. he was 70 years old. And he said, I'll never make the mistake of being 70 again. So he gets fired. Uh, Ralph Hawk takes over, and one of the part of the reason Hawk took over is because they were getting rumors that other teams were interested, and in the Yankees didn't want to lose him. Yep. So he became the manager, and he goes to. He was from Kansas, and he goes to Madison Square Garden uh, one night to watch a basketball game. Kansas was playing, I think, St. John's. I'm oh, not God, sure. I remember this stuff. Go ahead. And so Whitey Ford also was there because he had friends who played for St. John's, and he runs into Ralph Hawk, his new manager. Hauk had, had uh, decided that Johnny Sane was going to be his pitching coach. Mm -hmm. They had talked about possibly using a four-man rotation. Right. And so... Doing it on four... Uh, pitching every fourth, fourth day, day. Rather than every fifth. Right. So Ford... I mean, uh, Hauk says to Ford, how would you feel about pitching every fourth day instead of every fifth day? He said, I'd love it. I'm bored. I want, I want sure. to pitch more. more. That's when they decided Ford would pitch every fourth day, which he did, won 25 games, and never won 20 games before. Huge. But after, beyond that, there was a lot, big drop-off. I mean, they had decent pitches, but nobody, uh, Bill Stafford, uh, Roland Sheldon, uh, Jim, Jim Coates. Coates, Bud Daly was Art acquired. Art Mars, Art, Ralph Terry, Bob Ralph, Turley. Yeah, I mean, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. All second, yeah. All, all now fourth and fifth uh, number right. fours and fives. But... The infield was solid. Oh, good field. I mean, you've got you've got uh, Cleet Boy at third, a vacuum cleaner. Right. You've got Kubek at short. Right. You've got Richardson at second, and you've got Scourin. Talk about and you got Marison right, Mantle in center, and I guess Yogi in left. Hector, Hector Lopez. Hector Lopez and Yogi because Yogi was part of this triumvirate. Well, three of catches: catches: Johnny Blanchard, Elson Howard. Best catches ever. And Yogi Berra. <laughs> All combined hit, I think, 62 home runs. Or 64, something like yeah. that. Unbelievable. Talk about Maris as a player. He comes over the year before. He comes over in 1960 from Kansas City, their farm system. He wins. He win, I think he wins the Most Valuable Player yes, Award. He, he just beats out Mantle. Right. Talk about, And then he comes into 61. Talk about Maris as a ball player. Well, he was, first of all, Somebody did a very good scouting job because they recognized that he had a Yankee Stadium stroke. He was a dead pull Paul hitter, hitter. Right, a left-handed hitter, and that short porch. Right what was it, 297, yeah, 296? It was perfect for him. Uh, but also, he had, people forget, he began his career with the Cleveland Indians mm -hmm. and was a teammate of Rocky Colavito yep. uh, and was a pretty good player there. Then he winds up in Kansas City, was traded uh, because... Uh, uh, Frank Lane made the trade. Uh, well, he was crazy. He yeah, traded, traded everybody. everybody. So he traded into Kansas City, and he was a pretty good player. We we didn't know much about him, but we came to find out that he was an outstanding defensive player, a great all-around baseball player, good base runner. Never saw him get thrown out going from first to third on a and he And he took the base. Could run, could hit. Uh, and could feel, had a great arm. He could throw. Could throw. Made one of the great players in baseball history in the 1962 World Series when, uh, Go ahead. before the catch, when, when uh, 
Willie Mays. Oh, and the, he throws, the, he holds somebody at second. Right. Like at Ken Espermonte. No, right. it was, uh, Who was the it? Giants. It was in the World Series. Oh, okay. It was um, Willie Mays hit the ball. It was, I think it was Matty Alou. I don't remember. And but I remember the throw. Well, not only the throw, but he cut the ball off before it hit the, the fence. If right. it hits the fence, the it, guy's going to score. It, it, it rumbles around. Right. So he cuts the ball off. Fires a throw to uh, Richardson, who relays it home, and the runner has to hold at third. Yep. And eventually, the next batter is Willie McCovey, and he... Screaming hits, line <laughs> drive to end the After game. hitting a home oh, foul. My, home oh, run. I know. Please. Yankee you, luck, you know. You know, you know, the, the, you know we're, well, we were sitting there choking <laughs> because, you know, it, Mazeroski all over again, we were dying. So this is Maris. Maris is a great player. When Mickey Mantle got hurt in 1962 or 63 and missed about 60 games... They moved Maris to center field, and he played a better center field than Mano. Well, at that point, I mean, Mickey was Mickey was. Well, terrible. at any point, I don't think, you know, Mickey was not noted for his defense. He had a strong arm, and he could run balls down. Right. But he wasn't as he was, slick. He wasn't Willie Mays. So. And, and he wasn't Roger Maris. Right. Maris was a better center fielder than Mickey Mano. So you got this. Are they the best? Three four combination ever. I mean, you talked about the team being the best team. There's a lot of good three fours or four fives, mainly three fours. But that's a that's a pretty good one. I think uh, Gehrig and Ruth might be a little bit well, okay. better. You know, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. I mean, hit three eighty. Okay, so, and okay, Ruth, okay, yeah. okay. So you know this. <laughs> But then, then one of the arguments is, I mean, between the 27 and the 61 Yankees, which are the best team. But let's let's stick with the uh, the 60 and 61. All I said was the best I've ever seen. Right. I didn't see the no, 27. No, 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 no. I mean, you're not that old. I know. You've been around a while, though. <laughs> not that old. Okay. So 61 season begins. Houck's the manager. This starts off. They don't do very well. They didn't do well in spring training. No. Houck was getting a little nervous right. about it. They, they lost more games than they won in spring training. And. Uh, and then I, 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 I guess they lost opening day. I can't even remember. But he was nervous about what was going, what's going on with this team. And then also, they didn't really take over the the uh, talk about the Ray, the pennant the race. It was terrific. The Detroit Tigers. Oh man, yeah. Terrific. They had a great team. Yep. Uh, they had players having career years like Cash. Cash never hit. Ah. Like he did that. And year. then K-Line was always solid. K-Line was there, and they had. Uh, the pitching was terrific. Yeah. I mean, they had... Uh, wasn't it Frank Larry that... I hated him. Larry, he, he, the uh, Yankee uh, killer? You, uh, Frank, you hated him. I hated him. <laughs> I hated him, just like you hated the Yankees. I hated this hated guy. He was a killer. There's some guy on TV in Detroit who's saying right now, I hated uh, Whitey Ford. <laughs> right, right. No, I hated Frank Larry. Go ahead. That's a real pennant race. It was a terrific pennant race, and it, it wasn't until it was uh, um, Labor Day weekend that the Yankees, the Tigers came in, and the Yankees won, I think, the first two, th three games, won three out of four. Yeah. Uh, I remember one game where they had Don Morsey pitching. Uh, With the ears. And, yeah. <laughs> They, always remember they, said, he, they, they used to say about him that he looked like a taxi cab with its doors open. <laughs> He did. But he was a terrific him. pitcher, yeah. you know, and, and the, it, those were great uh, games that they played. And the Yankees finally took control of the race back then. And then they, I mean, they just walked over Cincinnati in the World Series. But, right. uh, but, but at that point, everything, the whole story was the, the home run race. Yeah. But it, low attendance at games. I mean, at the race at the, at the end, you know, when he's running for it, they're, they're playing before 20, 22, Well, the day that he, that he, when he broke the record, the last day of the season, 23,000 people. Out of this, a stadium that held what? 67? 60, 65, 70,000. Right. And, and this little, this young guy from Brooklyn, this right. guy's named Sal Durante, who uh, was 19 years old and drove a truck for a living, decided he was going to go to the baseball game and decided he was going to try to get seats in right field. And what, if, if you're trying to do it today and you wake up the morning of the game. No, forget it. Season. You can't get tickets. Forget <laughs> it. It was a different era. You couldn't. We used to get tickets just by walking to the, the, the box office. Well, apparently, Durante had gone to the game on the Friday night, and he noticed where Maris was hitting the ball in spring training. I mean, nobody else thought of this. Well, not in spring training. In, in batting, batting practice. practice. And he decided he was going to try to get seats in that general vicinity, which he did. And lo and behold, the ball is hit, and he catches it. And brings it down, and, and Maris graciously says to him, he wanted to give the ball to Maris. Right, and Maris said no. No, he said, 
you can make some money out there of it. There was a reward by a restaurateur in San Francisco for 5000 He said, collect the 5000 Exactly. He said, you, and he, that's great stuff. The guy was going to get married. Sal was going to get married. I, I talked to Sal not too long ago, every once in a while. He still lives in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. And he was going to get married. And Ralph and the, uh, Roger said to him, no, you keep the ball, sell it, get some money, get yourself a good start on your on your new no, life. That's great. It was great. Good guy. And then we go to 1998, the, the Maguire Sosa thing. You were into it as much as the rest of us? I was, but you know, I began to get a little jaded at that point. I was no longer with the paper right. and I wasn't on a daily basis, but I still followed the game. And it got to be a uh, a problem. I didn't realize at the time about the uh, steroids. Well, none of us. I yeah. mean, none of us did. But I mean, I got swept up. I got caught up in the fact that here's this guy. I mean, hitting these, hitting 70 home runs. It, it disturbed me because uh, it had been so many years that the, the, mm. the record lasts, and all of a sudden these numbers. And, and I started thinking, and I read stories. What's causing this? Well. They're tampering with the baseball. They're tampering with the bat. The stadium's uh, Small. are smaller. The pitching is not as good. The All strike zone things. is shrunk. And, All of those things. So there's a whole... I, I never put steroids no, in there. Well, no, nobody did, but, every, but, but those were the reasons. And then Bonds hit 73. So if we have an asterisk... Why don't we give the asterisk to Bonds and Maguire and Sosa? Because Roger Maris is the last non-juicer to hit That's correct. that many home runs. So People let's, are giving him an asterisk in their mind. People come on. Not. Absolutely. I mean, how do you judge these folks? I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't think baseball has an answer for that. I think they just ignore it. I, I mean, there's going to come a time. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm going to have a... It, if I'm still around, I'm going to have a, a Hall of Fame ballot, and on the ballot is going to be the name Barry Bonds. And what do I do? Right. Best player of his time before the steroids. Well, and that's then he what I'm out. thinking, and I think because of that, I'll have to you vote might, for it. Ooh. Okay, you have to come back. You're coming back anyway. <laughs> My thanks to Phil Pepe for being on the show. Relive the magic of the summer of 1961. Read Phil's book. See you next week on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.